Recording in progress. Okay, so very good. So last time, remember, we looked at uh, ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. And the way we described this was in terms of this SL2R n equals to 1 with some mean written model at level 1. And then the SU2 supersymmetric with some mean written model at level 1 plus uh, T4 on the world sheet. And then we know that, uh, we know that the SL2 uh, subalgebra here is to be identified with the Möbius symmetry of the dual CFT. And that allowed us to determine the space-time spectrum organized by conformal dimension. And what we saw was that the space-time conformal dimension coming from the W cycle twisted sector of the, uh, uh, sorry, coming from the W spectrally flowed sector of the world sheet theory. So, that, so in this factor, we have this uh, spectral flow. And what we saw was that the answer was equal to W squared minus 1 over 4W plus uh, N over W. Plus, uh, so I'm assuming here that H0 rest is equal to 0. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to that later on. And uh, so, so that was sort of the upshot of, uh, of the last lecture. And then you were meant to be excited about that, but uh, maybe you are not. But the idea is that this looks exactly like the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. So I want to start today's lecture by giving a, a brief interlude for those of you who are not familiar with the symmetric orbifold, what the symmetric orbifold of T4 will look like. Now, in order to make life simple, I'm going to discuss the symmetric orbifold of S1, of one free boson. So let's look at the symmetric orbifold of one free boson. And then it'll be clear how that will generalize to the case of T4. I mean, I don't want to clutter notation with all sorts of stuff that's irrelevant in order to explain the, the gist of it. So I'll just focus on the, on the key element. So what, what do you mean when people say the symmetric orbifold of S1? Well, so what you mean is you have n boson fields. Somehow this makes a funny noise, right? Let's hope it'll be better. I'm not sure. Anyway, so there are n boson fields, which I'll denote by dxi. And each of them has conformal dimension h equals to 1. And i runs here from 1 to n. Right? So these are the coordinates on the n copies of S1. And then you have what you mean by this is you take the theory that consists of n copies of a single free boson, i.e. the S1 theory. And you divide it by the symmetric group. You take an orbifold with respect to the symmetric group, where the symmetric group acts on the n bosons in the most obvious manner. It just interchanges the n bosons. So, I mean, there's no natural other action that you can think about. Okay, so now this is an orbifold, just like any other orbifold. So how do we describe an orbifold? Well, an orbifold theory has an untwisted sector. And the untwisted sector is sort of naively what you would think you get. So for example, if you think about it in terms of a Fox space, you would take the Fox space of this theory. So what does the Fox space of this theory look like? Well, if the modes of this are denoted by alpha, the Fox space of this theory will look like something like this. Right? You take all the modes of the different bosons and apply it to the ground state. And then you write on all the possible combinations you can write down. That describes for you the Fox space of the n-fold free boson theory. And now the idea is that in the untwisted sector, what you do is you project onto those combinations of states that are invariant under the SN group. So what you do, the untwisted sector consists of all of that subject to the singlet condition. By being invariant under the, under the SN group action, where the SN group action acts on the upper indices only. It exchanges just the copies of the fields. So that's the, that's the obvious untwisted sector like you always des describe it in any orbifold theory. Now, as you know, the untwisted sector somehow doesn't describe all of the orbifold theory because you're thinking of closed strings living on this quotient manifold. 
And on this quotient, there are closed strings that are originally closed, subject to this constraint, but then there are strings that didn't used to be closed when thinking of it in terms of this theory, but only become closed once you identify the endpoints under the action of the symmetric group, in this, uh, under the action of the orbifold group, which is the symmetric group in this case. Now, generally, you know that the twisted sectors are labeled by conjugacy classes of the orbifold group. Now, people are probably most familiar with abelian orbifolds. If the group is abelian, then the conjugacy classes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the group elements. And the correct generalization to a non-abelian orbifold group is that you label the twisted sector by conjugacy classes. Conjugacy classes consist of all those group elements that upon multiplicating by h and h to the minus one from left and right get mapped into one another. So the untwisted sectors are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the conjugacy classes of Sn. Now, what are the conjugacy classes of Sn? Sn is a permutation group, and you can write any permutation as a product of cycles. So, I mean, for example, you can write any permutation, for example, as 1, 2, 4, 7, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then six, for example. That would be an element of S7. And any permutation in S7, you can write in terms of its cycle. You start with the first element. It goes wherever it goes. Then this element goes wherever it goes. This element goes wherever it goes. And at some stage, you come back. And then you start with the next one that's left over, and so on. So any permutation, you can write in terms of products of cycles. And if you think about it, under the conjugation, the structure of the cycles doesn't change. The only thing that changes if you conjugate with this with an arbitrary element in S7 are the specific numbers that appear here. Because if you think about it, if you conjugate it, you just re rename 1 to 7 up to by something else. Then you do the original computation, your permutation, and then you re-unname. So therefore, this is, it's clear that, a conjugacy that different permutations with the same cycle shape sit in the same conjugacy class because they're clearly conjugate to one another. And you can prove that that's basically all the, all the identification you get from the conjugacy classes. So the conjugacy classes of Sn are in one-to-one -one one -one correspondence with cycle shapes and are therefore in one-to-one -one correspondence with, permutations, uh, with, with, with partitions of n, of writing n in terms of a sum of positive integers. And the positive integers are just the length of the cycles in which you decompose any given permutation. Yes. When, uh, when you have standard uh, orbifolds for abelian groups, uh, the, the twisted sectors are labeled by the element of the groups, which of course are the same of conjugacy classes. Can you clarify why in the non-abelian case, uh, what labels the twisted sector are the conjugacy classes and not just the element of the group? Well, suppose you start with a, an individual group element in a non-abelian orbifold, and then you have to make it invariant under the orbifold action, right? So in, in an abelian orbifold, what you do, the twisted sectors are labeled by group elements, but then within each twisted sector, you have to make it invariant under the whole orbifold group. Now, if you start in a non-abelian case, if you start with a twisted sector associated to a specific group element, and you try to make it invariant, what you're going to do, you have to sum over all the conjugacy, all the elements in the conjugacy class associated to the specific group element as you make it invariant. The, the, the thing that stabilizes the specific group element is just the centralizer, and the rest produces for you the copies in the conjugacy class. So each, the orbifold action links together the different elements in the conjugacy class. Great. That's the reason, I mean, I mean it's, this is not something I invent. I mean, this is standard folklore about orbifolds, but that's why for non-abelian orbifolds, it's labeled by conjugacy classes rather than individual group elements. Okay, so, so that's the general structure of a, of, a, of a twisted sector. It's labeled by a partition, or if you wish, a, uh, a, a, a cycle shape of a permutation of order n. Now, if you think about what we are trying to do, we are trying to describe uh, the CFT dual of string theory on ADS3, but we are looking at perturbative string theory, and we are looking at states that are made of, from one string. So if you think about it, what you expect, say, in the context of n equals to four superang mills, is you expect to find the single trace operators, the single particle states. You're not expecting to find the multi-particle traces from a perturbative single string analysis. 
the multi-trace states will come from multi-string states. And likewise here, the idea is that the single particle states, the things that are described by a single string, when I look at perturbative string theory on a single string, should correspond to the states that come from a single cycle twisted sector. So the idea is that the single particle states are those that have a con that whose conjugacy class is of this type, where I use the usual convention that you don't actually write cycle of length one. Cycles of length one always make up the number. Everybody you don't write out sits in a cycle of length one. And the idea is that a single particle states are not all the twisted sector. They are those twisted sector that correspond to a single cycle of length, arbitrary length, and uh, nothing happening in the rest. And then you see the multi, so this will be a two particle state because this consists of two non-trivial cycle and correspondingly the, the multi-particle states come from the sectors where you multiply the cycles together. That's the closest analog to multi-trace versus single trace in n equals to four. And that's, and if you think about it, if you go to string field theory, then this will exactly do this multi-particling for you and it will produce for you all the other sectors of the symmetric orbifold. So that is the correct part of the spectrum that we are going to see from a perturbative world sheet string theory analysis. So we're only going to look at a single cycle twisted sector. I mean, if you're interested in the theory of symmetric orbifolds, obviously you have to look at all of them, but in the context of relating to string theory, a single perturbative string, we'll just be focusing on the single particles part of the spectrum, which come from the single cycle twisted sectors alone. Okay, so what we have to understand is what does the particle spectrum, what does the spectrum, what's the Fox space in the W cycle twisted sector? So let's think about what this W cycle twisted sector looks like. So suppose sigma is the ground state of this W cycle twisted sector, then what does it mean to be in this W cycle twisted sector? Well, remember the intuition about twisted sector. Twisted sector describes those solutions that are not closed in the original theory, but they're only closed after identification by the permutation. So what this means, if I start with my field, say dxi here, and I go around, once I come around, this has changed to dxi plus one. If i is equal to one up to w minus one, right? So this is what this permutation does for you. As I go around with this field, it ends up with the image of this permutation applied to this field. That's what it means to be in the twisted sector. I mean, it's a solution that is not closed in the original description, but it's closed up to a permutation. And this permutation says exactly up to what it is closed. So it's, up to, up, it's closed up to the action of this permutation on the labels of the individual fields. So the first boson will become the second, the second will become the third, the third will become the fourth, the W minus one will become the Wth, and the Wth will become the first again. That is the, that is the structure of the W cycle twisted sector. That's what it means to be in a twisted sector. Namely, you don't close, except you only close up to a group element. Okay, so how can we describe the excitations in this W cycle twisted sector? Now, the idea is very simple. The, the idea is, so you see, you could try to find modes for the individual fields, but you won't have any luck. Because you see, suppose you try to write modes down for dx1, then it's not going to work because somehow the modes of dx1 will mix with the modes of dx2, will mix with the mode of dx3. So I can't just write down the mode expansion for each of the fields as I did originally in the untwisted sector. So I have to find a smarter set of fields that have a good mode expansion. And if you think about it for a moment, it's clear what this smarter set of fields is. This will be linear combinations of the first W many fields. So what we're going to look at are the linear combinations of the form. You take the sum from one to up to W, e to the two pi i, j times L over W, dx uh, j. So, for, so I choose L to be uh, zero up to W minus one. And for each such L, I look at this specific linear combination of fields. I mean, I'm obviously free to look at any linear combination of fields. This is all linear, this vector space. I just decide instead of working with dx1, dx2, dx3, where I mean the, with the curly bracket, I now look at dx straight bracket one, which is a linear combination 
of all the curly bracket ones. And now if you think about it, what happens with dxl as I take it around? So if I take dxl around the point sigma, what happens? Well, it'll become the sum j is equal to 1 up to w e to the 2 pi i jl over w times dx j plus 1. With the understanding that I periodically identify by w, which is fine. You see, this is periodic in w, so whether this is w or uh, this is a 0 or w doesn't make a, di a difference. Shifts by w drop out because they have the same phase. Right? That's what happens if I look at this linear combination. I take it around this field sitting in the W circle twisted sector. It comes rearranged because every, every of the field has moved one up one in, in the list. But now you see this is easy to rewrite. So this I write as e to the minus 2 pi i j over w, uh, sorry, uh, e to the minus 2 pi i l over w times the sum from j is equal to 1 to w e to the 2 pi i j plus 1 l over w dx j plus 1. Right? I just multiply by e to the 2 pi i l over w and e to the minus 2 pi i l over w. So I haven't done anything. But now you recognize that this is just the original field itself. Right? I just, I've just relabeled my summation running now from one step further. But it doesn't matter because it's periodic in w. So what you see is that these linear combinations of fields, they have a simple monodromy as I take them around this point, And the monodromy is simply the e to the minus 2 pi i l over w. So they pick up a phase as I take them around the twisted sector field. Now, what does this mean if I write them in terms of modes? Well, remember, so this is a spin 1 field. So this spin 1 field, I should still be able to write as a sum over r d uh, alpha uh, straight bracket l r uh, z to the minus r minus 1, right? I mean, a spin 1 field has a mode expansion where you have a minus 1 here. A spin h field has a mode expansion where you have a minus h here. So this is, I haven't changed the conformal dimension. This is just a linear sum, a linear combination of spin 1 fields. So it's still a spin 1 field. So I can ask what happens when I take that around. Well, when I take that around, I just replace z by e to the 2 pi i z, because I just go once around the origin. So this will go to the sum over r, alpha l r, uh, e to the minus 2 pi i r times z to the minus r minus 1. Right? This happens. So here I'm taking z around. And what this means, I multiply z by e to the 2 pi i z, which is what happens if you go around the origin once. <clears throat> but now you see this has to be equal to what we've just seen, e to the minus 2 pi i l over w times the sum over r, alpha r l, z to the minus r minus 1, because it has to be equal to the field up to this phase. But now if you compare the two sides, you see what you learn is that this phase has to be equal to that phase. You see the rest of the sum is exactly the same. So what this tells you is that this linear combination, if I think about it in terms of modes, has modes that are not integer moded anymore, but their mode numbers are such that e to the minus 2 pi i r is equal to e to the minus 2 pi i l over w. So what this tells you is that alpha l r has modes where r runs in um, l over w plus integer. Right? Because these are exactly the modes that, uh, I mean, if uh, I was uh, deliberate vague, I just uh, introduced this label r. I, didn't, I call, didn't call it n for a reason because as you see, in general, it's not an integer. It's whatever is required to have the right monodromy. And what's required to have the right monodromy is that R has to be equal to L over W mod integer. So you see what has happened in the W cycle twisted sector. Originally, we had W many fields that sort of were part of the game. You can always ignore the, the rest of the fields. They're just going along for the right. They're not doing anything. We are just concentrated on the first W fields. So originally, we had the first W fields. All of them were integer-moded. And in the 
L cycle twisted sector, sorry, in the W cycle twisted sector, what we end up are new fields where L runs from zero up to W minus one, but they look like the original field, like one original field, except that they have a fractional mode number. And if you, and you see in some sense, it's now redundant to introduce this label L here, because you see whatever, I mean, another way of saying this is that you now just have modes alpha R, where alpha R is an element in Z over W, right? Any value of the form Z over W will appear, and that just tells you which L you are talking about. You are talking about the L for which the R mode you've written down is of the form L over W plus Z. So what has happened is, instead of having W many integer modes, you have one mode, which is now W fractional. I mean, in some sense, you still have the same number of modes. I mean, originally you had W many things all integer moded. Now you have one thing, but it's much finer moded. It's moded in units of one over W because that's exactly what this gives you. And I'm accounting for all the fields. I'm just have reorganized re them so that they have a good mode expansion. Yes. Scusa, okay. Uh, sorry, maybe I missed it. Uh, could you repeat uh, why L should be an integer, at least? I mean, from, if I start from there, from the definition of the XL, I mean, I would uh, use any L in, uh, well, I mean, to the definition. Well, I mean, you see, you have W fields to start with, and you should write down that W linear combinations. So what I proposed is I write out these W linear combinations where I take L to be an integer. Okay. And what I'm claiming is, and I haven't shown this, is that the set of the set, the li these linear combinations are linearly independent of the original W okay. individual field. So I can either write it in terms of the original W field or in terms of okay. E. It's if just I were to um, introduce more L's, then I would introduce linear relations among them. Okay. So it's just um, convenient, and then one matches the, the degrees of freedom. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. so this is just a convenient rewriting. I mean, I have a W dimensional space. And I just use a different basis, but obviously I still have to use W many basis vectors because okay. I mean Thank more Thank can't you. be linearly independent. I just choose them smartly, namely like that, and then I see they have simple mode expansions, and the mode expansion is of that form. So now, if you ask yourself, what does the spectrum look like? Well, the spectrum where normally you would say L zero gets lifted up by integers, but now. In the, in, the, in, in the W cycle twisted sector, it'll get lifted up by integers divided by W. And you see, bingo, this is the first explanation of this factor. You see, this is exactly what this factor is telling you. So you see, N are the degrees of freedom of, say, the T4 theory. So there is nothing twisted about this. This looks like a single copy of a T4 theory. But what we see is that with respect to the space-time conformal dimension, it behaves as though the mode numbers are W fractionally moded, and thereby they behave exactly like the modes that you would see in a W cycle twisted sector of the symmetric orbit field. So this is the, the first big hint that we are doing the right thing. Now, the second hint is, and that I'm not going to explain it, I could explain it in detail, but this will probably take too much of my time, is uh, you could ask what is the, the ground state conformal dimension of the, so sigma is the ground state in this W cycle twisted sector. And you could ask what is its conformal dimension? What is the conformal dimension of sigma? And what you find is that, and I mean, on a certain level you are familiar with this because you see, when you go from the Neve Schwartz sector to the Ramon sector, that you're doing basically the same thing, right? Instead of having half integer moded fields, you have now integer moded fields. And you can ask what's the, and you know there's a Casimir energy involved in shifting the energy up from a Neve Schwartz sector to a Mamont sector. And likewise, you can calculate here what's the energy that's, uh, what's the energy shift, the, the, the ground state energy that you pick up from, um, uh, from being in the W cycle twisted sector. And what you find is for each boson, The, 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 the shift is W squared minus 1 over 24W. 
I mean, there are different ways in which you can derive this formula. Probably the easiest way is to use uh, modular techniques. You write down the character with the insertion of the, of the uh, orbifold element of the W cycle twist, and then you use the S modular transformation, and then you read off the conformal dimension in the sort of in the twisted sector. And when you do this, what you find is that if you do this for a single boson, you pick up a factor that the ground state energy is W squared minus one over 24 W. Now, that's what you get for a single boson, so for the example I've discussed here. But if you think about doing this for T4, you have four bosons, so you'll get uh, four times as much. And in fact, fermions, well, there's a small subtlety here, but let's, uh, let's uh, say W is odd, then the subtlety disappears, but I don't want to explain the details of it. Then the fermions behave exactly like half a boson. Then this just scales with the central charge. So in general, you would expect H of sigma to be the central charge times W squared minus one over 24 W, but the central charge of T4 is exactly six. So this will give you W squared minus one over four W. And that's exactly the first term in this formula which we found here. So this is the Casimir energy that you would expect for the symmetric orbifold of T4 because in the W cycle twisted sector, the ground state is shifted up by W squared minus one over 24 times the central charge. That reproduces exactly this ground state energy. And then on top of that, you have all these fractionally modes which come from the modes as I explained to you here. And that has exactly the structure as you see over there. So that's the reason why when you see this formula, you say, ah, this looks exactly like the symmetric orbifold of T4. There is a question here. Okay, good. C can I also think of this Casimir uh, stuff uh, by going to covering space? Like, sure, uh, sure, yeah. You can, I mean, Waltzian, no? There's various <laughs> ways in which you can derive this. Uh, I mean, you can derive it by the modular transformation, you can go to the covering space, you can write down the stress energy tensor. In the t so, I mean, the simplest way of deriving this is to write down the formula for the stress energy tensor in this <coughs> sector. So, this will be like this. And then you can simply work out L minus one on the ground state. This will not be zero anymore. And then in order to extract the eigenvalue, you can just apply L1. I mean, the reason you look at L minus one and L1 is then you don't have any normal ordering ambiguities, then it's unambiguous. And then if you work this out, uh, I'm probably going to make a mess of it, but then you, you can work it out and you arrive at this result. And I'm not attempting because otherwise I'll get my factors Another wrong. thing, so maybe, so in this theory, I like a lot of vertex operators too, no? of course. Uh, so w what are they on the string uh, in the ADS3 times S3 and so on? Well, Can so you see them? Uh, well, uh, so I mean, at this moment, we are identifying states, right? So we, identi so we, we know for each, yeah, so the state here is characterized by which fractional modes you mm -hmm. uh, excite. And then according to this dictionary, that just tells you which modes where you sort of remove the fractionality, you multiply the mode number by W, were originally excited on the T4. Um, the construction of vertex operators is an interesting one, and I'll come to that probably oh. tomorrow. Oh, okay, because okay, I then. want to explain how the correlation functions match, but that requires a certain number of preparations, and I'll try to explain oh, Okay, then I'll ask you tomorrow. <laughs> yes, please ask again if I don't explain it satisfactorily. I think there's another question over there. Maybe I misunderstood, I misunderstood the starting point, but I, I understood that W, if you want to take uh, the SN uh, symmetric orbifold, uh, W can go from 1 to N. Correct. But uh, yeah, so, so here uh, uh, in, in the strings, the W can take any integer value. Right, but remember that G string is uh, proportional to 1 over N. And in perturbative string theory, that means we take G string to zero. So what I'm doing here is always in the large n limit. So we are always in the large n limit. So we've taken n to infinity. But as I'll explain to you, the one over n corrections, which will correspond to the G string corrections, will be able to reproduce from the world sheet. The world sheet does not reproduce the finite n answer. The finite n answer would correspond to sort of non-perturbative effects from the point of view of the string theory, what you are going to do is perturbative string theory, so we are always taking the one over n, x, n goes to infinity expansion first, 
and then we systematically keep track of 1 over n corrections. But there are no 1 over n corrections to the spectrum, and therefore this formula is exact as it stands. And how should I think about this? I mean, uh, um, if you take n to be finite, it seems that you are truncating the spectral flow to, to uh, not to take all the possible integer values, but there should be some mechanism that... Uh, uh, yeah, so this, this description, I don't know how it will work at finite n. I think that's, okay. I mean, this is, a finite n is in some sense finite string coupling, right? Then, then you want, I mean, when you want to do perturbative string theory, you first start off by g string equal to zero, and then you think of switching on g. So that's the spirit here. The spirit here is you start with the theory where n is infinity, and then you systematically include one over n corrections in all the calculations, and they should come for higher genus world sheets. How the non-perturbative effects arise from the point of view of string theory and finite n effects would be non-perturbative from the string world sheet perspective is an interesting question, but one where we don't have an answer yet. But, but look, I mean, this is already pretty good if you can account for all the one over n corrections. It's like all the non-planar corrections of n equals to four super mills. You are also not, at, I mean, the, the finite n super mills is also totally out of reach from the point of view of ADS CFT. And uh, sorry, another question. Is it completely under control, this symmetric orbital when you take the larger limit? Huh? Absolutely. So uh, maybe I didn't explain this, but this has a very nice larger n limit. Okay. So there is a sense in which you can just take the, and the idea is that you see all the copies that are not involved are just in the vacuum. So therefore, things stabilize. So if you fix W and you take n to infinity, then everything stabilizes because you just add more vacua in the additional copies where you don't do anything. So therefore, the, the result doesn't really, once n is bigger than W, nothing ever will change again. So therefore, this has a very stable, you can write on the perturbative spectrum and it has a, it stabilizes it order for order. I mean, there's, there's no problem with taking the larger limit. Any other questions? Okay, so, um, yeah, so, but, so, so, so this looks right, but obviously I told you I cheated in a number of ways. I said that j was equal to a half. I didn't really explain to you why j had to be equal to a half plus i times zero, but I didn't explain this. And then the other question you would ask is, why are you just looking at the t4 degrees of freedom? You have all this other gunk in your world sheet and you have this SU2 at negative level, what are you going to do about that? And this is a legitimate question. And within the context of the NSR description, at this moment, we don't have a satisfactory explanation. I can give you a heuristic explanation of it, but in view of time, I'll probably skip that. It's, it's not totally satisfactorily. It's just this answer smells to be the right answer, but the NSR description at level one is a little bit uh, problematic. Let's put it that way. It has issues, the Americans would say. And so, so we have to... So we have to do a little bit better if we really want to find a satisfactory answer. And the idea is that we use the fact that there's an alternative description for strings on ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, and that's the so-called hybrid formalism. So, I mean, this wasn't invented to solve our problem. In fact, this was invented to solve an entirely different problem. This was invented to solve a way of giving access to world sheets that also have Ramon to Ramon background. That was what it was really invented for. But you can just take this theory and evaluate it for backgrounds with pure Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz flux. And in that case, the hybrid formalism involves the world sheet theory that has a Wessermino written model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2 level K plus uh, a topologically twisted uh, T4 theory plus uh, suitable ghosts. And what has been checked is that this theory, if you take k to be any number bigger than one, this theory seems from what one is able to check to agree exactly with the NSR description of Maldesino or Gori. I mean, this is not a proof, but this is, has been checked to the extent that one can check these things. And there's very good evidence that this is a perfectly equivalent description to the NSR description for any value of k greater or equal than two. And then, this theory, as I'm about to explain to you, also makes perfect sense at k equal to one. So our proposal will be that in order to make sense of the k equals to one theory, we should rather work with this description 
rather than the NSR description where I have all these little issues I have to be, to be fighting against. Now I see from your eyes that you're a little bit scared, so let me explain to you what P is U1, 1 slash 2 is and why it's natural that it appears and then let's, let me explain to you how you analyze this uh, world sheet theory. And you can analyze it by very similar methods than what I've done. And the reason I spend so much time on the NSR description is that here we can be extremely explicit and you can see everything how it works, but the answer will effectively work more or less the same way for this hybrid description. Okay, so what is P as U1, 1, 1 slash 2 and why should it appear? Okay, so P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2. If you think about it, it looks like a, a four by four matrix. It hasn't, so, so the, the, the convention here is you have an SU1, 1, 1 and an SU2. So there is one subgroup that is SU2 and then you have one subgroup that is SU1, 1, 1. And as uh, many of you probably know, SU1, 1 is a different name for SL2R. These are the same real forms. This is just this, the identically same Lie algebra, not just the complexification of it. As a real Lie algebra, they're really the same. It's just a different name. Whenever you see SU1, 1, 1, you can just replace it by SL2R. It's really exactly the same. So, so this is a super Lie algebra. So it has a bosonic subalgebra that's SU1, 1 plus SU2. And then it has fermions sitting here. So you have the fermions and the, the fermions sit in the 2 comma 2 with respect to the SU2 and the SL2 because they sit inside a 2 by 2 block in which the SU2 and the SL2 act from either side as a 2 and because we have guys here and guys here we have two of those. So P is your 1 comma 1 slash 2 is a Lie algebra that has eight fermions that namely two pairs of fermions that sit in by, by uh, spinner representations and then it has six bosons. The bosons are just SL2R plus SU2 and SL2R is a three-dimensional Lie algebra, SU2 is a three-dimensional Lie algebra, so this will have six bosons. So it's a super Lie algebra. So what does super Lie algebra mean? It's basically a Lie algebra except the, instead of commutators of the fermionic generators, you write anti-commutators, but that's it. I mean, for us, for physicists, that's not a big deal. I mean, we are used to anti-commutators or commutators, so it looks like a Lie algebra, except every now and then you have to write an anti-commutator, but then it satisfies the Jacobi identity and blah, 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 all the rest of it. So it's not, not much more complicated than a normal Lie algebra, it just has some anti-commuting generators rather than commuting generators. That's not, uh, that's not such a big deal. Now, why, why does P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 appear in this context? Well, that has a very simple reason because the, the dual CFT has N equals to 4 superconformal, is a superconformal field theory in two dimensions. Now, maybe you also don't exactly know what that means. So, what this means is it has a Vera Zero algebra because it's conformal. And then it has uh, four supercharges, so plus uh, four supercharges. So these are fields of the form G plus minus and G prime plus minus. So these, this is a field of conformal dimension H equals to two. These are th four fields of conformal dimension three halves. And then it has an R symmetry and the R symmetry is SU2. And uh, these are fields of conformal dimension one. That's what the n equals to 4 superconformal algebra looks like. I mean, I can write down all the commutation relation that will easily fill one of these blackboards and you'll copy it down, probably make a typo, and, but you can also just look it up on the web. I mean, it's a, it's a standard algebra. That's what you expect that you will conform a field theory to be like because that's what the symmetric orbifold of T4 is because that's what the T4 theory has. The T4 theory has this n equals to 4 superconformal symmetry. Now, from the point of view, so remember, in the case of the bosonic theory, we had the SL2R symmetry on the bulk, and that became the Möbius symmetry in the dual uh, conformal field theory, right? Remember, the rigid rotations of our ADS space became L0, L plus minus 1 on the boundary. Now, what characterizes L0 and L plus minus 1 inside the Virasoro algebra? 
Well, these are the global conformal transformations. These are the transformations, the generators that kill the vacuum and that kill the out vacuum. These are the generators that are really well defined on the sphere. So you can ask, what's the analog of SL2R for these other generators? And the answer is always simple. You take all the modes whose mode number is strictly less than H, less than the conformal dimension, because these are the modes that will kill the in vacuum and that will kill the out vacuum. So how many modes do we get? So if we look at the global modes of this, what are the global modes of this? Well, from Virasawa, we are going to get L0 and L plus minus 1. And we know already that this gives us a copy of SL2R. What are the global modes of SU2? Well, this will be the zero modes. The, the minus one mode and the one mode don't annihilate the in and the out vacuum, but the zero modes do. So from these guys, you get just the JA0 modes, or actually I'm going to call them KA0 in the future. And they'll gen generate a Lie algebra of SU2. And then of these guys, we are going to get the generators G plus minus. But since conformal dimension is three over two, the allowed modes will be plus or minus a half. So you will have these modes with generators plus or minus a half, and you will have the generators G prime plus minus with plus or minus a half. These are the global super, uh, super uh, conformal transformation, the supercurrent transformation. And now, if you think about it, you see you have a three, you have an SL2R, that's this SL2R, you have an SU2, that's this SU2, and these guys, the upper index tells you that they transform as a doublet of SU2, and the lower index tells you that they transform as a doublet of SL2R. So these guys sit in the 2, 2, and then we have another copy that sits in the 2, 2. And in fact, these precisely account for these fermions. So when you take the n equals to 4 superconformal algebra and you restrict to the modes that annihilate the in vacuum and the out vacuum, what you discover is that the Lie algebra they generate is PSU 1, 1 slash 2. And that makes a lot of sense from the world sheet perspective because you see the zero modes of PSU 1, 1 slash 2, these will be the global transformations from the point of view of the dual theory, and they should precisely reproduce the global part of the n equals to 4 superconformal algebra. So this is the supersymmetric generalization of what we saw earlier, that the SL2R Vesomino Witten model gives rise to the Möbius symmetry in the space-time CFT, and this is the souped up n equal to 4 version. Now you don't just have SL2, you also have SU2 for the R symmetry, and you have the appropriate supercharges. So the fact that PSU appears it's just the way of this theory to making sure that space-time supersymmetry is manifest. That's exactly what this factor does for you. The generators of PSU 1, 1 slash 2 are exactly the n equals to 4 transformations of the dual CFT. So that's why I sometimes say this is like the Green-Schwartz formulation. In the Green-Schwartz formulation, space-time supersymmetry is manifest, and here it is manifest by virtue of the factor that the zero modes of this factor are precisely the global n equals to 4 transformations of the dual CFT. Is that clear? Okay, so, so this is why this PSU factor appears, and now I have to explain to you how we are going to make sense, how we are analyzing the representation theory of that at level 1. And that is actually not so difficult, because in particular we already understand now the structure of this uh, super Lie algebra. So now let's ask what are the possible highest weight representations of PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1? Well, so how would you analyze this? Well, remember, so the highest weight representation, the highest weight states will form a representation of the zero mode algebra. So the highest weight states. they form a representation of PSU itself, right, without the affine bit, so I mean the zero modes. Now, now we know the structure of this. This has a bosonic algebra that's SL2R plus SU2. So every state we can label in terms of, say, and say we, we label them in terms of a, a pair of a, 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 a labels. So these are the states that transform, say, in the continuous spin J representation with the parameter alpha, and in the 
dimension n representation with respect to SU2. So uh, suppose I start with one state in the highest weight space and I say it transforms in that manner. So here the first label is a representation with respect to SL2R or SU11, which is the same thing. And this is the dimension, so n is equal to what you would call 2j plus 1 as a representation of SU2, right? So we can write down all the states that appear in the highest weight space in terms of representations of SL2R plus SU2 because that's the bosonic algebra that just acts. Now we have fermionic zero modes. Well, we have eight fermionic zero modes. They sit in two copies of the 2,2. Two. So what do you do when you have fermionic zero modes? Well, you make creation and annihilation operators out of them. So there will be four creation operators and there will be four annihilation operators. And without loss of generality, I can say, I start with the state that's killed by all the four annihilation operators and I apply the creation operators to it. So there are four fermionic creation operators and they sit in the 2,2 with respect to SL2 plus SU2. So what happens when I apply one of these creation operators, one of the four? Well, you see, as you apply one of the four, you're going to generate states. And because the fermionic generators sit in the representation of SL2 plus SU2, you will change the representation with respect to the bosonic algebra. So if you apply this, what will happen, you get a term that looks like J plus a half n plus one, that's when you take the plus plus component where the spin shifts up in both directions. Then you get C alpha J minus a half n plus one. Then you get C alpha J minus, uh, plus a half n minus one. And then you get C alpha J minus a half n minus one. Is it, is it clear what I'm doing here? I mean, I'm starting with this state and I'm now applying the four fermionic generators. And since these generator transform in the two comma two, what I have to do is I have to take the tensor product with respect to of SU2 of the n dimensional representation with the two dimensional representation. So I'm going to get either n plus one or n minus one. And then I have to do the same thing for the SL2 bit. And the SL2 bit, it does exactly the same thing. So J will be shifted up by a half or down by a half. So there'll be four terms because I can shift J up by a half and down by a half and I can shift N up by one and down by one and the two are not correlated with one another. So I get four summons at the first level when I build up my Clifford representation starting from the highest weight state and applying the fermionic generation, creation generators once. Okay, so now I've created it once, now, now let's do it again. Now when I do it again, obviously I have to be careful because I can't apply this exactly same fermionic generators again. So in the first line, I should expect to get four summons. In the second line, I should expect to get four choose two equals to six summons. So which six summons do I get? Well, the six summons that I get, are, so there's one term where I get C alpha J plus one. So when J gets shifted up yet another time, then I can't shift up N at the same time. So this has to go down. So this will be one term. Then there's a term where I do the opposite, where I shift the, the J down. So I go back to CJ, but then I go up to N plus two. And then there is a term that goes like, then there are actually two terms that are of the form CJ alpha, uh, sorry, G alpha J comma N, because there are two ways in which you can get it if you think about it but it's actually not important for the following. And then you have the mirror image of that, which is gj alpha n minus two plus uh, c alpha j minus one n. So, so, there are, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six state at the second level. And then at the third level, you get another copy of this. And then the fourth level, you get another copy of this. This is what the sort of Clifford algebra representations of super algebras look like, right? I mean, this is like standards. Is this familiar to you? Uh, I mean, this is a standard fermionic generators on some, on some Clifford algebra. Now, why am I belaboring this? Well, remember, we are sitting at level one. And what do we know about the highest rate representations of SU2 at level one? SU2 at level one has only two allowed highest rate representations. So if I just think about the SU2 factor, SU2 at level one has only the n equals to one representation and the n equals to two representation. These are the only possible representations at level one. 
any other representation is incompatible with the null vector in the, vac in the vertex operator algebra. So the only allowed representations of SU2 level one is the one dimensional and the two dimensional representation. But now look at this diagram and let's see whether I can find color that one can see. So you see, we start with N whatever it is, but then halfway down the diagram we find N plus two. Now this is, prob this is a problem, right? Because suppose we start with n equals to one here, we are going to reach n equals to three here. But n equals to three is not an allowed representation of SU2 at level one. So this means the generic representation is not compatible with the representation theory at level one because it produces an SU2 representation that's incompatible with just looking at the SU2 bit, I mean. In particular, it has to satisfy all the constraints that just come from SU2. So I know that this term can't be there if I sit at level one. Obviously, if I sit at level two, no problem. I can start at level two. I also have the three-dimensional representation. Then there will be a term that starts with a one, has a two here, a three here, two, one. Everything is fine. But at k equals to one, the generic long representation is not allowed. So what you learn from that is that the representation theory at p is u1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1, the only allowed representations for the highest weight states are short representations. Representations that are shorter than a generic Clifford algebra, i.e. some fermionic generators have to vanish. Otherwise you run into trouble just with the representation theory of SU2. So, so now you can ask, uh, okay, so then, so you see that something special happens. And then if you, if you analyze more carefully, you discover two things. You discover the only possible representation is the ultra short representation. So the only allowed representation is of the form that you start with the representation C A J J in the doublet so I'm actually writing this upside down for reasons that's a little bit more convenient. And then actually I was, I think I was a little bit amiss here. I should have shifted the, al the alpha values also shift by a half. So actually here th there's always a plus a half. Because I mean, when, when, you, when you add the J3 eigenvalue also shifts by a half integer, so the alpha parameter also shifts by a half. And then what you find is that you get um, alpha plus a half and actually what you find is that it's this representation. Same as this. Oops. So these are the only representations that appear. This is a short representation, so it has only three factors. All the other fermionic zero modes vanish. And then, as is familiar from BPS, representation, you see this, what you have to arrange is that a certain product of fermionic zero modes vanish. And that is generically not the case. So in order for this to be the case, you get a constraint on what the spin is. And what you find is that the constraint on the spin is that J has to be exactly equal to one half and no other value of J is allowed. So in particular, if you try to do this for a half plus IP, then the representation is necessarily long. So the fact that it's short is demanded by the fact that you are not allowed to have this state on grounds of the representation theory of SU2, and therefore it must be a short representation, but that fixes the spin to be exactly equal to one half. And that's, that's the special thing that happens at level one. The continuum that we had gets frozen out because it's incompatible with the structure of this super Lie algebra. This super Lie algebra insists on the fact that the spin is exactly equal to one half. And these are the only representations that are compatible with this structure, and uh, except for the vacuum representation, but uh, the, the representation of this kind. And I started here with the continuous representation. If I'd started with the discrete representation, the analysis would have been completely identical, and I would have ended up again with a representation of this kind with j is equal to a half. In fact, you see, at j equals to a half, if you choose alpha to be equals to a half, then it is actually the discrete representation. I mean, a continuous representation for alpha equals to a half at j equals to a half, you can't distinguish from the discrete representation because, I mean, the discrete representation is basically half of it. And uh, 
because it has all the same values. It's just, uh, it's essentially the same representation. It's not strictly speaking, I mean, this is the uh, indecomposable representation that contains the discrete representation as an irreducible sub-representation. Now I've said it, I'm not going to say it again, but basically the discrete representation of J equals to half is contained in there. And if you do the analysis starting from the discrete representations, again, you get exactly the same. This is the BPS constraint. This is the BPS constraint, and it comes from the shortening, which is an intrinsic property of this level one representation theory. So this is the easiest way of, you can also see it in a, in a variety of other ways. You can study the null vectors of some virus or algebra generator. There are various ways in which to see that this is the only consistent representation of this level one theory. This is the easiest way of seeing it because it appeals to something you know, namely that the SU2 level one representation theory is so simple. Okay, so that, that explains why, why this, is, this is the explanation of this fact. And in this context, it really just comes out of the representation theory of this super Lie algebra. And I'm not making any assumption here. I'm just analyzing it from first principles, and that's what I get. And there's nothing, nothing else I can do. And then what you can do is you can, um, uh, in fact, there's a free field realization of this theory, but maybe I don't really have, um, it's a bit, um, I don't really have time uh, to explain it given that I've only five minutes left, so maybe I'll, I'll try to sketch it briefly at the beginning of next time. But what's important is now then you can do the counting, and the counting here, you see, so this is a very special representation, and you can calculate its character. I mean, the representation of P is U1, 1 slash 2, level K, there is some math literature on it. This is not uncharted territory, so you can look up the books, and you can work out what the character looks like at K equals to 1. And what happens is, that it only has two bosonic degrees of freedom. You see, generically, you would expect six bosonic descendants if you look at a generic representation of this algebra. So it if you look at the bosons, it should go like one over eta to the six because each boson you can basically excite independently. But you know already that that's going to miscount badly because at level one, you know that SU2 at level one is really equivalent to a single free boson. So SU2 at level one, instead of having three bosons, has really a single boson. And what happens here is, it, in some moral sense, the same thing happens for SL2R. So instead of having three plus three bosonic excitation modes, you have one plus one. If you just, so if you calculate the character of this representation, it just grows like one over eta squared if you look at the bosonic degrees of freedom. But then if you apply the physical state condition, the physical state condition is going to eat up two bosonic degrees of freedom like it always does, and what you read off from that is that there are no descendant degrees of freedom coming from the PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 factor of your world sheet theory. Because if you calculate this character, it really behaves, it grows as fast as though it has uh, two free bosons. And then once you impose the physical state condition, that will eat up the bosons from here. And the only bosons that will survive come from the T4. And that explains why the spectrum really looks like only stuff made up from the T4. I mean, remember, I said it was n over w, but I didn't specify what n counts. Now I'm telling you, in this way of thinking about it, a physical state condition removes all the descendant degrees of freedom from here, keeps only the descendant degrees of freedom from here, and then you match exactly the number of degrees of freedom as you would expect from the T4. And this calculation for how, what the conformal, space-time conformal dimension of these states are goes through, not identically, but in an analogous fashion, and you then end up on the nose with the single particle, the single trace spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. And now there is really very little room for maneuver. I mean, we have honestly understood why this is J equals to half. We honestly understand the physical state count counting, or pretty honestly understand the physical state counting condition. And we get on the nose the partition function of the, symmet the, single, part the single cycle sector of the symmetric orbifold of T4. So this is, the, this is the sort of more honest version of uh, the NSR description. It requires a little bit of technology, but you see it also tells you why there was a problem with the NSR sector. You see, what this tells you is the three-dimensional representation of SU2 is not an allowed representation for the highest weight states because it's not compatible with the structure. But if you think about it, in the NSR formulation, the fermions sit in the adjoint representation of SU2, 
uh, in the three-dimensional representation of SU2. So in the NSR description, you started with degrees of freedom, which you discover from the hybrid point of view are not allowed in the first place. So therefore, the NSR description screams at you that you have to remove these fermions. They want, you started with something you shouldn't have started with because at level one, they are not compatible with the actual symmetry underlying the problem. So that's the reason why the NSR formulation leads to this SU2 level minus one factor. The minus one factor tells you that you have to remove some degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom you have to remove are the degrees of freedom you shouldn't have introduced in the first place because they're not actually allowed by the representation theory of this superconforming algebra. So this is the short answer for what, why the NSR description is a bit awkward and how this comes out cleanly in the hybrid formulation. So I think my time is up. So what I want to do next time is I want to, I probably briefly mention the free field realization, but then I want to concentrate on how to reproduce the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold. So the correlation function of the symmetric orbifold you can calculate in terms of covering maps. So I'll explain to you how you can calculate correlation function in the symmetric orbifold. And then I explain to you how they arise from this specific world sheet description. And they arise in a very transparent fashion, namely you really reproduce exactly the structure of the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold coming from this world sheet theory. But uh, that's what I'll do next time. Thank you. Thank you.